Hello and welcome to this video. Today we're going to be talking about the theodicy of mystery, which is one of the responses that a theist can have in response to the problem of evil. Today we're going to be talking a few areas and elements surrounding the theodicy of mystery, and we're also going to be talking about some possible developments and implications of this theodicy. Now what I like about the theodicy of mystery is that instead of trying to purely use reason and philosophy to try to create a possible world in which God and evil exist, as you can see in the free will defense. What the theodicy of mystery is trying to do is to start from the Bible. For example, we're going to be talking a lot about the book of Job and also look at Christian sources like Dostoevsky. And we're going to see from how a Christian perspective, purely from the Bible, can we respond to the problem of evil. Now, of course, there are going to be some shortcomings, which we will be discussing it later when we touch upon skeptical theism. Nevertheless, it is a very important theodicy and I can't wait to share it with you. So, what is the theodicy of mystery? Theodicy of mystery has kind of two strands to it. On one hand, there's a more strictly philosophical hand, and on the other hand, it's more of an existential discussion. On the philosophical side of things, the theodicy of mystery is saying, well, we do not have sufficient evidence to make a claim about any of the variables within the argument. So, for example, when the logical problem of evil says, well, okay, God is, God is good, or God is evil, or, or God is all-powerful, whatever these attributes are, what the theodicy of mystery is saying, well, okay, we cannot actually claim what those variables are. We do not know exactly what these variables are. And as a result, since we do not know what the variables are, philosophically speaking, the atheist has the burden of proof to demonstrate what those are, but since he cannot, because of course, the argument and idea from mystery is that we cannot know what these things are, therefore the argument fails philosophically, because when the atheist is saying, well, okay, God cannot exist because I believe God is X, Y, and Z, and evil exists, there's some contradiction there. If you say, well, all right, try to define your terms and they can't define it, they can't determine what God is, then their argument is not strong. For example, if I said, well, the sky is red and I cannot define what the sky is red, I have not made a very good argument either. But of course, there's also a very existential element to the theodicy of mystery, which is saying that, well, the phenomena of evil, when we're wrestling with the idea of evil in the world, what we're talking about is not just the idea that, okay, there's a philosophical application to the idea of evil, but rather when we're talking about evil in the world, we're talking about a true phenomena that no matter how much we try to rationalize it, there is still an element of mystery to that evil and that no possible reasons and ideas can possibly rationalize and synthesize and make us understand and truly realize why evil exists. And in some sense, that's an existential point because you're saying, well, all right, evil exists. I exist in relation to evil. How can I wrestle with the question of evil, which is this question of existentialism and is not a question of pure philosophy. So we have a broad view of what the theodicy of mystery is trying to do. So let us elaborate it by looking at a few forms of thought in relationship to the, the theodicy of mystery. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is apophatic theology. Now, apophatic theology is um, in response to or in, in contrast to cataphatic philosophy, which is positive philosophy. So apophatic being negative, this is thinkers like Via Negativa, this is like Dionysus the Areographite, I've completely butchered that name, but what is this is trying to say? It is trying to describe God via negative proclamation. So according to students of apophatic theology, and most of these are Russian Orthodox, Orthodox theologians, because the West quite like the positive proclamations of God. God is good, God is strong, God is all powerful. What apophaticism is saying is, well, God is not evil. God is not bad. God is not, not all powerful. So when you're thinking about these ideas, so they're using the negative or double negatives to affirm God's properties, what apophatic theology is demonstrating is that, well, although we can try to get towards what God is, we can only do that via understanding what God is not. So although definitionally we do not understand exactly God is X, Y, or Z, what we can say is, well, okay, these, this is the set of all possible descriptions of someone. If we cut out everything else, let's cut out everything else, we get at least a better idea of what this is. Maybe we do not know exactly what it is, but at least we start to have an understanding of what it is like. So that is the idea of apophatic theology, especially seen in Eastern philosophy. And as a result, those roots are trying to help us get us closer to God. 
And if you accept apophatic theology, then you're almost dedicated or you're almost committed to a form of skeptical theism or a term or, or the theology of mystery, because then you could just say to the atheist or the challenger that, well, yes, we understand that there's a very strong point of evil in the world, but unfortunately for your philosophical argument, and this is purely from a philosophical perspective, you are unable to sustain or you're unable to defend your arguments of what God is and what those properties exactly are to be in contradiction to evil. So as a result, by using apophatic theology, by using the negative, you in some sense are able to defeat the structural presentation of the problem of evil. Now, now that we've talked a bit about apophatic theology, let's talk a bit about skeptical theism. Now, skeptical theism is very similar to apophatic theodicy, theology in the sense that skeptical theism also stems from the idea that we cannot fully understand God. So there's this epistemic distance between us and God. So if we are here, our knowledge of God, which is here and is limited. So although we can understand a bit, you can see here I've drawn some breaks in that line just to say that while we might understand a bit of God, we don't know fully about the God's plans, God's ideas, who God is. And as a result, when we are claiming or when an atheist is claiming, well, all right, there are certain elements of Christianity which are in contradiction to evil or makes or evil makes certain elements of Christianity improbable. Well, you could just say, well, actually, we do not have enough evidence on our hands to actually make a proper decision about this situation. So skeptical theism would suggest that we just do not know or have enough information to make a claim in favor or against the existence of God. Now that we've talked a bit about apophatic theology and skeptical theism, let us turn towards the biblical evidence for the theodicy of mystery. And I think this is the area where the theodicy of mystery is the strongest because this is the area in which we're relying purely on the Bible. Because at the end of the day, the problem of evil is a challenge of internal consistency. How can we understand the existence of evil in relationship to the Christian claims? The Christian claims, according to the theist, that God is good, all-powerful, and all these things. The Christian also claims that evil exists. The problem of evil is saying, well, that idea that those sets of propositions are very unlikely. However, if we're turning back to our understanding of the Bible, well, we could say, well, okay, we say God is good, perhaps, but that good can only be contextualized within the framework of the Bible. So, for example, when we say God is good or God is all-powerful, these claims of good and all-powerful must be seen in relationship to other phenomena within the Bible. And the best example is the book of Job. So no matter how we try to represent God as being good or God is all-powerful, those definitions, how we define good and how we define all-powerful, it must be in line and must be aware of our understanding of the book of Job. And what we see in the book of Job, and I wouldn't go in depth into it, but what we see in the book of Job is a situation where God is is allowing the devil to make Job suffer. It, he almost in some sense tortures Job to allow his own name to be praised in the relationship to the devil. Now, of course, it's not really God doing the torturing, but God allows the devil to torture him. And as a result, when you're thinking about God, good and all powerful, we very soon realize that a God which allows the things to happen to Job is very different from the conception of goodness and all powerful that we use or see in the modern world we have today. And as a result, when we're thinking about, well, okay, what are those properties which are actually in contradiction to evil? We understand that good and all powerful can only be limited to the understanding of good and all powerful in relation to the book of Job. And when we actually open the Bible and look at the book of Job, if you turn to Job chapter 40, verse two, you say, will the one who contends with the mighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And then Job answered the Lord in verse 3 and verse 4, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Now, what that seems to suggest is that when we're thinking about the idea of the book of Job, what we're seeing is God himself is telling, God himself is providing a theodicy of mystery. Because if you think about what God was just saying, God was saying, well, hey, look, Job, I know you suffered a lot, but can you answer me why I did that? Can you tell me of my plans to Job? And Job is just saying, well, I, I seriously cannot. In all honesty, I cannot provide a theodicy of knowledge. I'm providing a theodicy of mystery. I do not know. And as a result, Job responds to the problem of evil placed by God with the theodicy of mystery. So we understand that within the biblical landscape, the theodicy of mystery is a very strong element of this discussion. 
Now that we've talked a bit about the theodicy mystery in, in relation to Job, let's talk about the theodicy mystery vis-a-vis -vis Dostoevsky, and this is best seen within Ivan's mutiny with, or rebellion, depending on translation, in the Brothers Karamazov. And what we see here, and why I called it that Dostoevsky is also using the theodicy mystery, is not only because Dostoevsky was heavily reliant on Job, so there was a lot of influence between those two thinkers, but it was also because of Ivan Karamazov's claims and constant recollections and proclamations that, well, all right, God, 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 I really don't know why you've allowed all these suffering to happen to children. Because you need to remember that Ivan Karamazov's problem of evil is not that he's saying, well, okay, I don't believe God exists because God is logically inconsistent with evil. He is saying, well, regardless of whether there is a God or not, what the evil that is being suffered is completely inexplicable. It's absurd. I have no understanding about why this evil exists. And it's almost this cry to desperation to God of why do you allow evil to happen to, to children? And in, in, in many senses, Dostoevsky doesn't answer that directly. He's not trying to provide a suggestion or a solution to that challenge. He's just saying, well, there is a mystery. I don't understand what's going on, but there is a response. There is a mystery. And Zosima in the story once again refers to Job. So there is that connection there, as I've said previously. So now that we've thought about different approaches to the theodicy of mystery from the lens of skeptical theism, apophatic theology, Job and Dostoevsky, I would like to talk a bit about possible challenges to the theodicy of mystery. So now these are two main challenges that you might come across. Of course, there may be more depending on who you're talking to. But these are the two main challenges. The first thing is that it doesn't actually respond to the problem of evil. Now, why might someone say this challenge? Well, someone might take this challenge because they might feel that since you're saying, well, okay, there isn't an actual reason for why God and evil coexist, they might feel that you haven't responded to their objection. And in some sense, they're right. And the reason why they're right is because when they're making the problem of evil and when they're making this challenge, they are presupposing that there already is a seeming inconsistency between God and evil. So they assume, and I'll just use uh, some like kind of wiggly lines to d demonstrate or mean signify inconsistency here. But from their perspective, they already established that there is some inconsistency between God and evil. And as a result, they're expecting you to do kind of like the soul building theology or the free will defense to demonstrate how God and evil can coexist together in a straight line. I'll just use that to signify coexisting. So in some sense, they're expecting you to use a theodicy, a traditional theodicy, to find that coexistence. However, there, as we've said before, what you're trying to do with the theodicy of mystery is not say, okay, there actually is some reason for why God and evil coexist. What you're trying to say is, well, actually, hold up a second. You cannot even make this assumption. Your fundamental assumption of the problem of evil does not stand. Why? Because, well you cannot even define what God is. And if you cannot define one of your variables, you cannot have a valid argument. And just a way to think about it is, well, you have a valid argument if you have perhaps if x, then y, and then x, therefore y, right? That's a valid argument. However, the challenge then arises is, well, what if you just ha make this undefined? Let's have a question there. We do not know what this is. Then no matter how, what you try to do, although the structure is valid, the, the argument is not sound and you cannot make a sound argument based off these undefined variables. And as the same way, if, you, if you're making the theodicy a mystery, when you, if you're challenging their problem of evil, you're saying that, well, God is in some sense not knowable. You cannot know what God is. And if that's the case, then they cannot make a sound argument. Now, apart from the challenge that the theodicy mystery doesn't respond to the problem of evil, you can also talk about why people might challenge that it is not convincing. Now, some people would say that the theodicy mystery is not convincing because really it only kind of responds to the theistic structure. It's not going to make an atheist who's suffered evil to think, well, actually, well, what am I meant to do with evil? I still feel there's an inconsistency between God and evil. So what would you do in that position? Well, I think there's two things you can do. Firstly, you can turn back to, and this is why I made previous videos on the soul building theology, the free will defense and the cosmic conflict theology. You can return to arguments and reasons for why these are not inconsistent. Now, of course, you can return by doing that. So if it's not convincing, you can turn to arguments for that, like the free will defense and uh, soul building theology. But you could also say that, well, actually, hold up a second. The entire project, and we'll talk about this in the next video when we're talking about anti-theodicies, but we can say, well, hold up, the whole project of the problem of evil is flawed. What you're trying to say is, well, philosophy and reason can explain the totality of the
the problem of evil. But the reality is, evil is a very diverse, it's a very deep and a strong problem. And as a result, by saying, well, okay, well, these things aren't fully answering the problem. Well, you know what? We cannot expect to fully understand the problem of evil. But the question is, well, what worldview can best respond to evil? What's the best worldview which can respond to the challenge of suffering and evil in the world? And if we maintain that it is the Christian worldview, then you understand that even if it may not be convincing per se to the atheist who's saying, well, I believe there's inconsistency here, it could be convincing to other Christians and also to honest atheists who are saying, well, actually, let's take a step back from the philosophical problem of evil because we've already demonstrated there is some problems with it and say, well, actually, maybe I, my presuppositions are incorrect and maybe a Christian worldview is the way to go. So I hope you've enjoyed this summary of the theology of mystery. Hope you found it helpful. If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure to like and subscribe and share this video with your friends if you found this helpful. Of course, if you want more information on the problem of evil, then check out this problem of evil series. We've been making a lot of content on the problem of evil recently, and I hope you enjoy it. Stay safe, my friends. God bless, and I'll see you next one. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.